I'm Steve Vibronix, and this is the Life in Dub podcast, talking to people who live their lives in dub and reggae. Episode number 22. Welcome to the 22nd episode of the Life in Dub podcast. I hope you're all okay out there and coping with all the craziness that seems to be pretty much never-ending. Thanks for taking the time to listen, and thanks to everyone that's been getting in touch with comments and ideas for the show. I love to receive these, so please keep them coming in. You can drop me a line at vibronics at gmail.com or any of the usual social media places. A little reminder, as usual, to keep sharing life in dub. Tell people about it, give the show nice reviews on iTunes, all that kind of stuff really helps to keep it all going and growing and reaching more people with these amazing life stories that we get every two weeks. This week, I want to talk a bit about my new sound system. That kind of isn't a sound system, but still kind of is. Let me explain. It's called the Distant Drum Sound System, and it's actually a multimedia exhibition that tells the story of the struggles that made sound systems, the music, and the message behind it happen. Physically, it's a beautifully crafted, retro-looking wooden sound system designed by me and Jim from the 12-volt Bada Boom Sound, and it's built by Nick from Dub Cub, all part of the extended Leicester Reggae family. The story was written by Madhu Messenger, and it's a really heartfelt and moving look back at the journey from Africa via the transatlantic slave trade and the colonial plantation system right up to the worldwide movement that is the sound system seen today. We got Maccabee to record the words and I set them to music. The sound system though does not have many speakers in it. It's actually full of computer screens that show some amazing animations created all the way over in Bogota, Colombia by Ricardo and his team from the El Gran Latido sound system. Now, the plan was to take it out on the street, to festivals, galleries, museums, all kinds of places this year. So we all know what happened to this year. So we had a little launch of the Distant Drum sound system in Leicester last week at the Graphwork Gallery just to make it public. If you want to find out more, just let me know. But we do hope next year we can bring it out and spread this amazing experience far and wide. This week, my guest is Solo Banton. Solo is a talented and charismatic performer, lyricist, producer, host, and a great interviewer himself. Check out his old ragamuffin show to see what I mean. During the interview, I got a chance to find out how his life in dub started back in London as a young child obsessed with reggae music and sound systems. We also talk about how COVID has messed up the music industry and about his future plans. We had a great chat, so enough of me. Let's get on with the interview. So, Solo Banton... Welcome to the Life in Dub podcast. Greetings, King. Good thanks. Yeah, yeah, nice. Nice you could join me. So we've been talking about it for a while. So yeah, it's, nice, it's nice to get around and do it. So I've been, I've been looking forward to this. So. Nice. And, and ni- nice to talk to someone who is also like an interviewer as well. So I mean, we'll talk about that a bit later on, but it's kind of... Okay, you know, so. <laughs> well, listen, what I do is at the beginning of the podcast, I ask everyone the same question. And that's just to kind of name a track that's that's been really important to you or really turned a corner for you. Or, you know, when you look back, you think, you know what, that track sums up something that's kind of important. So I was wondering if you've got an example of a track like that you want to share with us. Um, I, think, I think there's a few, to be honest, for different yeah, occasions. It's hard, but to, hard to come up with one. Yeah, yeah. But I'll have to say... Um, Ooh, it's hard. <laughs> I've got two in mind and I'm trying to choose between yeah, the you two. You can have them both solo, you can have them both. Really? For you, anything. All right then, well, if it's both of them, it's um, uh, the SPG by Linton Crazy. Mm-hmm. And um, do you want to know why? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, if you want to like go through each one in turn. It's Linton Crazy Johnson, SPG. That was the first time I realised... Um, about lyrics that you could write lyrics about what was going on. That's when I the first time I really realised um that you could do social commentary. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is when I heard it's when I heard that album and especially that track there because then I saw it on the news and then and then and then I heard the song and that's when that's when it really dawned on me um about lyrics and and, and social commentary. So that's really important to me. That was an important time for me. That made me think about wanting to do. To what into hold on my can do that, you know. What what sort of age were you when you when you heard that? About ten. Wow. Okay. About ten, eleven, yeah. Yeah, because it's very um like powerful stuff to be hearing at that age when your friends are yeah, listening to like yeah. pop music and whatever. I mean, there was always reggae in the house still. So I'm sure I heard I'm sure I heard loads of other stuff. It was Bob or or, or whatever like that, but 
that's the first one that really made me realize, oh, I could write a lyrics about what's going on around me. You know, I I, I kind of before that I'd hear a song, and 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 just think um it took um I don't know I was gonna say uh, it took a special person to be able to write a song, or it took a in a industry or a factory to write a song. That was the first time I realized that I could do it. It's the first time I realized that I could look at life and write a song about what I'm what I'm experiencing. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing about Linton Crazy Johnson is he just he just tells it straight how he is, but he, he does it in a very exactly. beautiful way. But he just tells it straight, and I think that's kind of like exactly. you know to to be able to think, yeah, well, like he's talking to me about you know what's going on. That's, yeah, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, and and it was clear that it was um it was you know he was talking about a personal experience. You know? So that's when it really dawned on me that I could write about personal experiences, kind of thing, you know. So so that that's a big song for me still. And um, the other one is Johnny Osborne. He can surely turn the tide. That song there, um, I just listened to it, used to listen to it over and over again, you know. And it, um, I think it shaped me, uh, shaped my faith. Well, it's, it's, it's one of those songs that almost needs no kind of introduction. It's just such a like powerful kind of like, you know, everlasting classic, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it just, I think, um, yeah, and that just really, um, it, it really set me on the path uh, of my faith, you know. Um, so, yeah, those are, those are the, the two most powerful. Nice, nice. So, to sort of start things off in terms of, like, your life and stuff, I mean, where where do you come from and, like, where, you know, where, where, were, you, where were you brought up? Uh, I grew up in Shepherd's Bush, uh, the White City Estate. I, I grew up there and um yeah, big family. Uh I've got like five siblings. I'm, I'm the youngest of five and stuff, but so it was it was it was, it was um I loved my childhood. I, lo- I loved it. I I'm just kinda of grateful for life anyway, but um I loved it. It was just there was just so much going on. It was never a dull moment, you know. It, there was always something happening and always something going on, especially growing up on a on a housing estate. And there's so many other kids around and there's so many different families that there's a lot of flavour, you know, you really experience life growing up in the house and it stayed there still. So, yeah. Just London as well, it's like, you know, people flock to London because I, I come from this yeah. crappy little town so I used to go to London when I could because it, it was the place. So to kind of yeah. be born and raised there, to have it all around you, I mean, that's like, I, I was always like envious of that kind of thing, you know. You, you know what you can do though? I found that when I got when um, when I got older, I really had this. Sometimes, uh, especially in that in that period, maybe, but we kind of grew up thinking London was everything, and there was nothing outside of London. So anytime, anytime you used to hear people about leaving, going outside, if you heard about a sound playing outside of London, they call everywhere outside of London country. That's true. You're going country. You're going country. You know, and you just. You just really thought the world was London. And then the first, I'll never forget the first time I heard a sound from that was not from London. I was just amazed. I was just amazed. Because you just expected them um, to be like second rate, I guess. I expected them to be second rate and they was not at all. They sounded 15 times better than the London sounds. Are you are, are you going to name and shame? Do you, what, what was the sound? The first sound I heard, um, was um, V Rocket, uh huh, Nottingham, yeah, V Rocket from Nottingham. So, what it was, we used to listen to, to sound tapes all the time, session tapes all the time, you know, Saxon, Coxon, Unity, Volcano, Java, you know, so on and so forth, you know. <clears throat> and um, every year, maybe twice a year if you was lucky, but every year there'd be a new tape of Saxon versus V Rocket. And um, like you used to look forward to the to the new year, to the next dance, you know, the next year around, new dub place, new lyrics, you know. But the tapes, you don't, I don't, we'd only ever hear the Saxon side. We only ever ever had the Saxon tape, but it used to go off like the dance with the the, the tape would be fire, mm-hmm. and there'd be like some real arguments on the microphone. You could hear them argue with the other sound, and it was a real rivalry, you know. So it kind of made it <clears throat> made me think, and we started thinking. Well, who's this sound V Rocky then? They must be, they must have some power, some strength. 
if they could play with sex in year after year and it gets it gets the sex around them so rolled up, they must be they must be a good sound and not yeah, a they wouldn't bother if it was like some like yeah pound exactly. Thing. And they were finally then we saw a flyer and they was they was playing in um where was they playing not in Stonebridge it was in St Raff's State in Northwest London they had V Rocket Java and Coxon so I was like there's no way we're missing this got to go to this dance and went to this dance and we got their perfect timing as well so when we got there Coxon was playing and then um, and then Java played and then V Rocket played when we got there and when V Rocket switched on I was just like oh my goodness me so what, what was the dance like back then again it's something I ask a lot of people about but I'm just so you know I can't get enough of sort of first hand like kind of tales of like because they, they just don't happen like that, dances anymore. The world's a different place now. So what, what was it like for you going to those dances? I mean, what was... It was a school. It was uh, it was university. It wasn't even a school, it was university. Because um, everything you wanted to learn about, you could learn about in that, in, in that dance. You know? Um, not just musically as well. Socially as well, you just learn everything. So, so Especially as young as when we first started getting to the dance and stuff. They'd just be all characters inside there, you know, and you started to learn about life. So you started to look at certain people and you'd be like, all right, they're man there, they're the rude boys there. You don't really, you don't bother them, those guys there, you know, and they're probably the ones that's one of them, one of them is probably selling as well. So we could go and get a drawer for them, you know what I mean? But you'd learn to, your approach would have to be respectful, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. And then, and then, you know what I mean? And then, and then you'll see who the sweet boys are, you know what I mean? And they always go and stand next to the girls and they'll be, they'll be the ones wearing some, some crisp clothes, you know what I mean? A silk shirt and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And, and, um, yeah, we just, you just learn about life as well as musically, you know what I mean? But socially, you learn a, a lot as well. And what, what kind of music are you hearing in a dance like that? What if, if you've got a V Rocket, Java, Coxon, then what, what are they playing when, when you were going? Well, every, they're, they're, everyone's just playing dub plates. Everyone's playing dub plates. I mean, you might hear something that you that you knew, and if you did, um, it, it'd probably be the sound that was the first one to play from three months ago, four months ago, and they'd be playing it's like, you hear this tune? Me was the first one to play this tune here. Or something like that, you know. So you you go there for a lesson. You go there and listen to new music. That's where you would hear your new music, and you'd hear it a month, two months, three months before before it would come on road. Before anybody could buy, you know. So you'd be searching for it. You go to you go to Dublin or go to a record shop like weeks after. Say, yeah, oh, this song I heard this song and I was Pat Anthony and he's singing this, singing that. You have that, and you know, no one, nobody could find it, you know. So musically, what, what be, about? Go on, sorry. What about um, what about people on the mic as well? Because when you got big sounds like that, you, only certain people really can hold the mic for those sounds, I guess. Well, you you, you had to be a certain level. Like it, it, it wasn't. You had to be amongst the crew, and they had to know your worth. You know, they really did have to have to know your worth, kind of thing. And um, so yeah, and listening to the mic, man, like every it was never. Every dance was individual. You might hear certain songs that you knew. You might even hear certain lyrics that you knew. But every dance was different because of the different sound that was in there, or just because of the different crowd and and, and the mic. The, the the mic men um, would would respond to what's going on in the dance, and the selectors would respond to what's going on in the dance. So they wouldn't go there with with necessarily a, a playlist, you know. If something happened and, and I don't know, they'd, they'd find a tune for that. You know, if somebody was drunk, you know, if you had somebody who was drunk and they was near the sound and maybe they nearly knocked over the sound or they bumped the needle <laughs> and made a needle bump, you know what I mean? You hear the mic man pull it up and, and, and start custom and tell them to move with your drunk self or something like that. And then the selector would draw for a tune like um, um One Scotch, One Beer, Man. One beer, or you know what I mean, and then, and then they put the version, and then the mic man will start chatting lyrics about people who can't handle their drink or whatever like that. You know what I mean? So like everything it was always in the moment. It's crazy how the people make such a part of it, rather than like kind of passively watching what's going on. It's a kind of no, you, you was know, all involved. It's, it's in all the going dance. on. You was all involved in the dance, and you all would influence the dance as well. 
you could, it was so easy to influence the dance. Like, you know, you got what you wanted, you know? So if the crowd went there and they just like, if the crowd really wanted to hear a clash, even though the two sounds might not really have been billed as a clash, but, you know, you could egg on a clash and, and then get the two sounds to start clashing, you know? Although most dances those time, there was always some form of competition, even if they wasn't actually saying, yo, we're going to kill you, your sound dead. You know, they would still, it'd still be um friendly competition, you know? And did you make it out of London to go and hear any sounds? I mean, you talked about hearing V Rock, it come to London, but it's kind of did you did you like break out of the city and Well that well that check? was the moment. That was the pivotal moment where we was like, Yeah, we need to drive. We need to start driving. We need to go and listen to what's going on outside of London. That was the moment. That's what I mean. That's when I said to you that you kinda growing up in London, you kinda everywhere else was country, so you kinda mm-hmm. You, you know, we wasn't really... I mean, we was young at the time still, so I'm sure we we would have done it naturally anyway and started travelling, but that was the moment we were just like, yeah, you know what, we've got to, we've got to travel. we got to hear what's going on outside of London, you know? And then um, we got a little mini, a little mini Cooper. <laughs> and we drove... Nice. <laughs> we drove to Birmingham. <laughs> no lights and no insurance, nothing. And we drove to Birmingham. It was Birmingham Carnival. And in a Mini, an old Mini is yeah, a bit of a trek, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's like noisy and bumpy. Exactly, and... all the way to Birmingham. How many people in there? Not five. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was five of us, I think, in the Mini. No. Yeah, it was. It was five of us, man. Because <laughs> people, people see the Minis now, these like posh German-made, whatever, but the old Minis were like go-karts. Right? Yeah, they were, yeah, exactly. They were about as big as a go-kart, big as a matchbox, and then five of us squeezing in that went Birmingham. Birmingham Carnival, we got up there late, so we missed the park. But we went to a blues. What's if it was in the blues? Okay. Yeah, we got What in was a, that like? Oh, any, any recollections of oh, that? I love that that blues. Yeah. We got in there at, um, I don't know, we must have got in there about 11. And we left there at like 8 in the morning. Okay. And um, we went upstairs, like they had the whole house. We went upstairs to a room upstairs. And um, the floor was moving. Like, if he stood still, it was like he was standing on a trampoline while somebody was dancing on a trampoline. Just from the pressure of the bus. Just from the pressure. The amount, well, no, from the amount of people that was in there. Okay. The amount of people that was in there and the place was rocking, the floor was bouncing and stuff like that, you know. So he's like, oh, this is dangerous, man. Let's not stay in here. So we went downstairs, which made no sense at all because if the floor had collapsed, we would have been underneath <laughs> it. <laughs> when you're young, though, you know, you can make some crazy decisions. So, yeah. yeah. And without wanting to talk about, you know, the current situation, it's like that's zero social distancing. It's unimaginable now. This just a place ram full of people. Ram. Ram, 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 ram. Every dance was ram. Well, most dances would be ram, you know. And did that kind of um did you start travelling more and going around the country? Did did you come to Leicester at all? Because there was loads of dances in Leicester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we did come to Leicester, but you know, I used to come to to Leicester a lot in in the nineties. So when I I left London and I moved to Reading, and I joined um, Classic Wonder Sound, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, we used to come. We used to play Leicester quite regularly. So what the workshop? We used to play the workshop Community centre. Sorry, what was that name? That centre? The the, commu- the community centre, Highfields Community Centre. Yeah. Yeah, well, Leicester's got a slice of the pie, definitely. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, I guess at some point you started to obviously get involved in it and went from being someone who attended to someone who was actually in it. And, like, how, how did that happen? Well, that happened when I was in London still. I mean, um, well, my big brother used to have a sound system. He had a sound called um, King Sharma International. And um, so I used to go in the mic with him when I could. You know, and um, he took me. He took me to a couple of dances. And my sister was a music addict as well, and, and she took me to a few, to a few um, blueses, and to a few dances as well. But as a young, like if you was those days there, if you knew the the promoter, or if you was with a responsible adult, you know, some people would let you in, some gay men would let you in. So uh, my sister and my brother was taking me to dances when I was about fourteen, fifteen. And when when did you first? Get the mic in a session. Do you, do you remember when that was? I started writing lyrics when I was like 12, 11, 12. And I, and I, and I chatted on my brother's sound when I was 12. I used, to call, I used to call myself Professor Brown then. 
those are the days of Billy Boyo, when Billy Boyo first came out and things like that, you know. So I heard Billy Boyo and I was like, oh, if he could do it, I could do it, you know. And he's a cool myself, Professor. Yes, Professor Brown, you know, you know that. And did you kind of teach yourself or did you get mentorship from anyone? I taught myself, just listen to music, listen to sound tapes. My brother used to go to dances all the time, go and listen to Fat Man and listen to Tubbies. And he'd always, those days as well, even just before I was raving, you know, you could you could take your ghetto blaster into the dance. Everyone used to be walking along with their ghetto blaster just to play music while they was walking along. And um, so you go to the dance and um, like the security would say to you, if I see the red light come on, I'm going to take it off you. You know, certain sounds, certain sounds like, like trying to stop people from recording the, the sessions, you know what I mean? But yeah, so my brother used to take his ghetto blaster and record the session and then come back and I'll be listening to the tubby tapes and stuff like that. And, and listen to the to, to the people on the mic and just, just listen and learn, listen and learn. And I say, when you've got those sound tapes, it's like, hey, you've not got that quality of a studio recorded record or whatever, but you've got the music there. You've got all the latest tunes and all the kind of vibe around it. It's kind of like, that's kind of all you need in a lot of ways. Will you capture the whole room? If anything, sometimes I think it might be um, even better because you've got the whole room, you've got the atmosphere of the room. So when you hear when you hear a song play and then you hear the crowd erupt, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you learn the power of you, you you learn the power of it and you learn the power of how to play, you know, how different sound man used to um how they drop the bass different or they do some some reverb on the on the tops before they drop the bass, you know. Or how they used to do the echo when they when they pull up the tune. Uh, and different sound effects. Those days, every sound you have did have their own sound effects. So, like, I became, I shouldn't say I, I think we all could do it. But you could get on the bus. I remember getting on the bus and you're listening, somebody would have, have a Walkman on with their headphones on, playing like a sound tape loud. And you'd only need to listen to three minutes of it and you could tell what sound it was. Jamaican sound or English sound. Because they've got their own sound effect and their own. Because of the kind of tune there was, because of the kind of tune I was playing, and and then especially the sound effects, and you just know who that was. Did there definitely seem to be a lot of like personality in sounds, in like yeah. boxes and preamp and selection and sound effects, and like just more individualism and. Yeah, you know. definitely. Everybody, everybody wanted to be different. There wasn't many sounds that had the same sound effects. And and you know you could even get cuts for having the same sound effects. <laughs> so like we used to have the same preamp. We had the same preamp as um as Saxon. Saxon's or one of Saxon's old preamps. And um, but you couldn't use those sound effects. There was it was a big bank of sound effects, but you wouldn't use the sound effects that Saxon used because Saxon had already made them famous. And, and and if he did use them, you know the other sound. If he was clashing or whatever, the other sound would say, "Oh, you're trying to sound like Saxon," you know. So being a, it being individual and having your own identity was was, was so important. And it's kind of difficult, um, you know, because when you're younger, everything is kind of more exciting and new and everything. But it's like there seemed to be like a, just like a um, I don't know how to say it really, but like a just a, a bigger vibe for the music then. It seemed to be like really, you know, pe- people just seemed to be more into it and the, the, the events seemed to be kind of, just have a stronger vibe. And would you say it was like that? Oh, definitely. But I think there was more of a hunger for it as well, you know? So you cherished the moment. When you saw a fly and there was a dance and then you could go, you was excited to go, you cherished, you cherished it, you know? Whereas I think um, people are spoiled for music now. There's so much music they don't hear any music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, it's, it's not it's not a precious thing because there's just so much of it. You don't have it's to, so much of it. Yeah, you I know? guess if it's like if you're a billionaire, it's like having so much money you just don't care. You know, but yeah, you're poor, man, really man, care, like, you dollar know? is everything. Exactly. To you, to you, it's just a jumper, or to you, it's just a car because you've got thirty cars on the drive or whatever in the garage. You know. And what about you getting? Um, you know, getting involved in it then. So you started, you know, with like family sound system, obviously, and when you were young and... That's where it was, yeah. So yeah, I'd do that. And then um, when we was in school, um, me and two friends, we, we made a little sound. We built our own decks. But at the time, they used to build your own decks as well, you know. So you used to go to Edgeware Road. There was a, a shop in Edgeware Road and you could buy just the... Uh... Because I'd see the ones, you'd get the 
platter and put it on your own. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You get the platter. Yes. So it would have the motor, it would have the turntable, and it would have the arm. And that's all you get. And then, um, so then you'll buy that, and then, and then you have to get some, some wood, some timber, then you'll build the surround to hold the platter in so you'll make your own deck, you know? And um, so what we done, we made um, we made two. This is when hip hop was really just going mad in, in the UK as well. And we made um, we had two platters and made it in one unit with two decks and a mixer. But we didn't have a mixer. We had um, we didn't have a mixer with with faders, you know. They came later. We, we, we just had like yeah, we just had two not like um, like two volume controls for each deck, but it was one big unit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you like selecting as well as like as chatting and stuff were you were you like a record buyer and I mean I've seen you select yeah oh uh, yeah 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 as soon as, soon, as soon as I started getting as soon as I started getting money I started buying records I mean my sister used to buy so much records she was always buying records so I was always borrowing her records to play in the house and stuff you know so um I, I became a vinyl addict a music addict from a very early age just because of my sister and my brother or my sisters and my brother. We played out twice. We played at a party once. We played at my friend's party once. And then we played a blues um, with another sound. Uh, and that was it. You know, and then I joined uh then I joined more of a proper sound system called Majestic that was from Acton. And that was that was like a blues party sound and stuff. We cut a couple of dub plates. Oh, we used to play more parties and blues. It wasn't really a dance hall sound. And were you involved and, um, in everything used... lifting the boxes and Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You remember the sound and then <laughs> had to do had to do everything. So when I joined that sound as a soul selector, I just used to play soul, I used to play rare groove. Nice. So I used to collect I used to collect rare groove uh, uh and stuff. So I used to I joined that sound, I just used to play soul and um play lovers rock. I used to play soul and play the lovers rock. M- moving on to like like with your career and stuff, it's like when did you first like go into a studio or like record something when, when did that kind of stuff you know I was up? never really interested in doing that you know a couple of opportunities came up to do it um, but I, I, I used to turn them down not turn them down but I used to shy away from it I was never really interested the first time I went to the studio um, Bushman and a guy called Trevor T rest in peace he, he's no longer with us um, he used to run a sound called Tipperton mm-hmm. And um, that was Robert Ranks' sound. So you know Robert Ranks from um, One Extra or whatever? Yeah, he used to be in this sound called um, Tipper Tone. It's where General Levy come from as well, actually. Okay. And um, that was owned by Trevor T. So anyway, Trevor T and Bushman took me to the studio to, to record some dub plates for them. It was the first time that I'd done anything serious in the studio, as in voicing. I used to go to the studio with my brothers who used to be in a band, I used to play in a band, so I used to go to the studio with them when they was recording and rehearsing. Even had to go on the mixing desk a couple of times because scientists used to be my idol, you know. Of course, yeah. But I was never really interested in it, really and truly. So it was just, just more interested in like performing and the sessions and stuff. I was just happy in the dance. Mm-hmm. I was just happy. In, I was just happy being a sound man in the dance. And is that really. because it's it, is it that the, the, there's a sort of legendariness of people who appear on the records it's a bit like I'm, I'm kind of not worthy is it a bit like that or yes yeah. yes definitely because I always had the same it's kind of there's people that like music and then there's people who put records out and they're like a different thing altogether you know, they're on another level exactly and you don't realise you can be there until you make that step no exactly so yeah I was never I never never really inter- interested in trying to do it myself then I became a producer and I produced a few songs. I used to go to, like I used to go to the studio as much as possible with people. If people went to the studio, and I put in my two pens all of the time. Then I, I then I um got into writing songs and and producing songs, and I produced a few tunes for people in there. And then I um I pressed up a couple of some vinyl as well, on my label. But I still never actually I still never actually wanted to put myself on record. You know, I still had that thing about me. So I was writing choruses for people and I was producing songs for people, but I was never really interested in doing it myself. What what made you take that step and how did that happen? Chris Chemis. Okay. Chris Chemis made me do it, basically. So I was <laughs> made you out, do I, it. I, yeah. Well, honestly, like we, we, I moved to Reading and um, yeah, I was playing the sound and then started producing tunes and stuff like that. And I 
Deadly Hunter introduced me to Chris. Deadly had got some rhythms from Chris and he introduced me to Chris. And I asked Chris to come to another studio to play some guitar on a rhythm that I was producing. And so Chris come there and um and started to play, and play some guitar on one of my rhythm tracks for me. And um just while we was we wasn't doing anything, so I went into the um the voicing room and I started chatting some lyrics, some of my old lyrics and stuff like that. And uh, on on the rhythm, just have a muck, just have a, a muck around kind of thing. And when I come out of when I come out of the voice room, Chris was like, "Are you good? You know, I want to record you. I want to record you. I want to record you." He just didn't really let up with that. And then we done. Um, I think we was just having a little vibe session at his house, and um, somebody recorded it on video, and Chris put it up on YouTube. <laughs> and Jatari, and yeah, and Jatari contacted Chris. Chris had done some other stuff with Jatari as well. And um, Jatari contacted Chris and said, that guy's solo, we, we want to record him, you know? And they sent a rhythm. And Chris was like, listen, these guys want to voice you. And I was like, even then I turned it down. I was like, no, nah, not me, me. That's it, because that's quite something when someone, especially someone from foreign or whatever, they, they say, we want to put you on a record or whatever. That's like, you know, it's great to get that confidence, like boost from yeah. someone. But at the same time, it's also like, if you're not ready for it, it's kind of... It's a bit of a jump to make. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know. So, like, I don't know. We must have had the rhythm sitting on the rhythm for, like, six weeks or something like that. And Chris was like, have you written anything for that yet? These guys, are out there hounding me for it, you know. You should just do it. You should just do it. You should just do it. And Chris was just on at me. You should just do it. You should just do it. And um, so I'd done it. And the next thing I know, they, they turned around and said, yeah, they're releasing. I was like, they're releasing it? On a real record. On a real, I'm like they're releasing it. He's like, yeah, they're gonna release it, you know. And they released it, and um, yeah, they sold out, sold out. <laughs> nice. And what? How, how? How was that? How did it feel to be kind of to be on a record as a record collector and music lover to have your own record in your hand? Yeah, it was crazy. It was completely crazy. I, I didn't know what to make of it. It was kind of crazy. I said, like, "What is going on?" And then they released it, and they sold. It sold out in like two, three weeks. I think it was. Um, like a thousand copies went and I said like what is going on <laughs> nice nice I was well then I went away I used to go away with Deadly Hunter Deadly Hunter used to um, um, take me away he used to like do backing vocals for him or he, and I would introduce him you know and um, we went away we went to Denmark so you'd seen how things were that there was a scene in Europe and yeah. it's possible to go places and perform yeah, exactly. and so, you know kind of start a career if you like yeah, exactly. So, like, Deadly, I'd known Deadly for years, you know, so anytime Deadly had a show, if I could go, I'd go and support and be there. So I started introducing him, and then I started doing a bit of backing vocal. Yeah, after I introduced him, hold on to the mic and do a bit of backing vocals, and then then he started bringing me out and letting me do, one like, a one lyrics kind of thing, you know. And we went to Denmark, and um, I was sitting outside around by the fire. The sound system's playing, and I hear this song, and I was like, I know that song. I'm like, wow, that's my song. And I ran over to the tent. And when I got there, they just pulled it up and, and put on another song. And, and Hunter was there. And I was like, I was looking for you everywhere. I thought you was inside. He said, they played your tune and it mashed up the place. He said, they pulled it up like three times. It takes a while to get like that confidence, doesn't it? When you hear someone else play it and you see people react to it, it's kind of, that's the stuff that, well, de- definitely for me, that just helped me kind of just realize, okay, you, you can do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Especially if it's, you know, definitely. If, you know, if you've got friends or you know some people, it's one thing. But if it's in somewhere completely different, you've got no connection with it at all and people are enjoying it, then that's quite a, you know, it's quite a thing, I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing still. So, yeah, so basically that's how it happened, really. But I was, um, it was Chris that was really pushing me to do it. Nice. Yeah, because I remember when your name appeared on these records and it's like, you know, Solo Banton, it's a distinctive name and obviously the voice to go with it as well. And it's just kind of, um, I guess that started a, you know, a series of releases and kind of, and a bit of demand. Because when when you have a record out that people like, people get on the phone and try and track the vocalist down, in in my experience. Yeah, it it, kind of... Yeah, it's just exactly like Chris, like, oh, you know what, you need to do this, You you need to get on MySpace, you know, you need to do this and you need and all these things I just had to just like oh I need to do this I better do that 
Because <laughs> when they actually when they released the song and I, I hadn't had I didn't have any of that kind of stuff, but I still was not thinking in that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't even think I'd done that straight away after that first release. I think it took maybe another release after that before I was like, oh, I better start taking this seriously. And when when did you hook up with with Dubchasm? Because um, Strider was a previous guest on the podcast and. Um, you seem to do quite a lot of work with with Strider and Digi as well. Yeah, um, I can't. I'm not sure what the link was. Who made the contact? You know, I'm not sure. How, I can't really remember. I honestly can't remember. But I, I know that I went up there. Me and Deadly went up to went to Bristol to do the Suffrage Choice. Strider wanted to interview us on the Suffrage Choice. Um, so I think that was the first time I met him. Definitely. And um, I don't know, we just got on. Mm-hmm. We just clicked. We just clicked from day one. Because you seem to do a lot of travels together and be like a real gang for a while. Yeah, yeah, we just clicked. It, we, we just clicked. So, yeah, we've done a few shows, pushed to do a few shows together, and then um, and people just really liked it. And so the, the, the show just, after we've done a couple, the shows just kept on coming in. But um, I think people could just see that we enjoyed each other as well, you know. Um, so, and, and that reflects in what you're doing and when you're performing. It's a bit like it's like in any team sport. If you want to refer to this as a team sport, I think if the team get get on, then you're gonna have a successful team on the pitch. If they get on off the pitch, so to speak, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's like if you get that chemistry and you kind of and you, you you're working together, you're a unit. Then you can you know you can really do stuff. And also the traveling thing is kind of interesting because like. If I remember rightly, that's why I think we met at like Gatwick Airport because we, yeah, we, we did, were both yeah. going somewhere. And then, and it, you're just someone I've bumped into at every airport and very rarely in, in the UK, but in different places in the world. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you seem to have done a lot of traveling. Oh, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it's amazing. I really wish my um, brother in law said to me, you should keep a journal. And I never did. And I really, and I really do wish I did now. It's hard to remember um, them all, because, yeah, it? yeah, and that's why I wish I did because it's just really hard to remember them all. But yeah, I've been, um, I've been most places. <laughs> I mean, literally all around the world. Is that right? Yeah, I, I've been most places. I've been South America, Brazil, Peru, um, Mexico, America, Canada, Russia, Siberia, all of Eastern Europe. Japan, um, Africa, yeah. I was meant to go to Australia this year. I was meant to go. I was go, going to Australia on the Wednesday and Monday. They um, lockdown started. That's it. This this year was the year it was all going to happen. I was set to go to like Latin America for another tour, and it's kind of yeah, yeah, things things ground to a halt. But it, 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 is traveling something that that you, do you enjoy and like you know going to these places? I mean, what what What's it like being on the road? It's changed from what it first was. Like when when it first started happening, you're just like, "Wow, I can't believe it!" You know. So, um, I, and I'm still very grateful, of course, and and it's amazing. Some of the things I've seen and places that I've been, I never would have dreamt of going there. There's no way I would have gone there if it wasn't for the music, like Eastern Europe. What? what why would I go to the Ukraine? Why would I go to Bulgaria? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These things weren't these things weren't even in my mindset at all. And but I've been to all these places and made great friends and had a wonderful time there. You know, so um, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. It can. It's it's harder than what people think. Oh, yeah, I remember talking to you about it in the in the midst of it, and you you were we were doing one show together and you, you were going off to, to do another two in two different countries. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, solo's working hard, man. But it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, people just don't realise that it's, because it is great, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing to do, but it is, you know, you've got to get to these places and that's not easy. That's, it, it, oh, it's not easy at all. You know the ones that, you've got to get that early flight in the morning then you land and then they, they pick you up from the airport and they're like, yes, it, so it's just a three-hour drive now. It's <laughs> like, what? Yeah, nice. Well, one, one other thing I'm kind of interested in is like, that I've been following is your um, Ragamuffin show um, and um, really enjoying your interviews with people and it's kind of, 
it just seems to be, you, you seem to be in your element. I mean, I don't know if you want to tell us a bit about what all that's about. Yeah, the old ragamuffin show. It's, um, yeah, we thought that we would, um, I really wanted to try and highlight uh, there's so many champions in the community, you know, so many champions of people who are doing, doing some great stuff, some unsung heroes, you know, and um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to do that and bring some light light onto, onto people that are doing that, as well as talking talking to friends in, in the music scene as well. And um, But there's a lot of people that um, do a lot of stuff that are, that's not seen. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's... Um, and I think there's just a lot of people, especially within the music scene as well, there's a lot of people that's doing stuff that's not seen. There's a lot of people with great opinions and great ideas and ideologies that people don't really get to hear. You know, so it's just more of wanting to bring a light to those kind of things, you know. So, um, yeah, and basically that's it. And just have a bit of fun. You know me, I'm always, I always like to laugh as, as well. Do you know? What had, I mean? had you done anything like that before? Because you, you, you do. You know, you, you seem to be a natural at it. Definitely. You know, you should, you should be on the that, telly. Um, something though. Come on. <laughs> you know, Chris has always said that. You know, Chris has always said that. Um, it's something I it's something that I just do to be honest with you. It's something that I, I just do naturally. Like when I'm hosting a stage, uh, um, like at Boomtown and stuff like that, people people say to me, "Do you know what you're gonna say?" Because sometimes I'm out there. I don't just introduce the people and run off stage. I like I stay out there for like 15 minutes. It's a big crowd as well, isn't it? A big crowd at Boomtown. But I'll be out there for 15 minutes telling jokes and stuff like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> People was like, well, like, well, how do you do that? Do you write it? And I'm like, no, I just, it's just something I could do. I'm like really shy amongst people. I think a lot of people think I'm rude <laughs> because if it's only, if there's only three of us, four of us, I'm going to be really quiet. I'm really, really quiet. But people don't really match that with the person who will go on stage in front of X amount of people uh, uh, and being as bold as anything, you know, and saying all kind of stuff. And, and people don't really match that with when you're quiet. Because like your lyrics and 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 the way you perform comes ap- across really strong. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. You, you wouldn't use the word shy. Yeah, I, t- I tell people that I'm shy, and then they start laughing at me. <laughs> it's just like you're not shy. I said I really am. Honestly, like I'm getting better at it now because I know that a lot of I've given a lot of people like a, a misconception about me because I think they think I'm being standoffish, and it's just because I'm shy. Do you know what I mean? But um yeah, uh, as far as like the hosting and stuff like that, it's just I just I really enjoy doing that kind of stuff. I I just like creativity, you know. I was in a play once. Do you remember what the play was? It was a um I can never remember what it was called, you know. What's the play with Puck in it? Not Midsummer Night's Dream, is it? Yes, exactly. Exactly that Midsummer Night's Dream. But it was like um yeah, it was a more up to date kind of street version if you want to call it but there was a lot of there was a lot of the old English language in it as well like we, we would go from the old English language to street language and back it was uh, like a comedy you know well talking about like hosting and stuff as well is recently obviously a lot of people would have seen that you've been doing these like kind of hosting these debates about um, you know uh, black culture and music and kind of you know, yeah. the sort of political and social angle about kind of what, what we do. Um, yeah. And um, I don't know if you want to say a bit about how that came about, because that's kind of interesting and kind of, you know, very important thing to be doing. I, I was approached, some, they, they they approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in, in, in hosting it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the idea kind of grew, grew together, but I, I was approached saying, do you know what, I think maybe we should do something, you know. And we was going to do it as an old ragamuffin show at first. And then the way that it just kind of grew, we was thinking like, no, you know, it would be good to, would be good to have a panel uh, and do something. I mean, these, these times here, we all need to learn. We all need to relearn a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that we all think that we know and we don't know, including our own behavior as well, you know? And, um, and to, to grow, you, you can't refuse knowledge. Um, so yeah, any, anything that facilitates that, I'm, I'm interested in. And what what, what was the reaction to that? Because obviously, you know, when, when you're talking about people's opinions about stuff that's like that, a lot of people don't like to talk about, then um, I wonder what it's like, kind of 
dealing with all these different, you know, differing opinions on things which are, you know, very important and personal. It's um, it, it was the reaction was good. The reaction was good, um, as in people responded. Um, I'd say it made people uncomfortable, and there was a lot of disagreement because it's just people's opinions, mm-hmm. and and I think that's fine. I think that's exactly what you need. If if anything, one of the things that we all need to learn is is learning to accept somebody else's opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. If you don't listen to somebody else's opinion, then you're not going to learn anything. Yeah, I mean that's one of the big problems of like social media, isn't it? Is you just end up getting loads of stuff that agrees with where you're coming from, and you kind of forget that most of the world thinks very differently. Yeah, and you're not challenging yourself. There's different ways you can learn. You know, as in. I can see somebody do something and be like, I am never going to do that in my life. That's a wrong move. I'm not into that. I'm not going to do that. But I've learned something, haven't I? If I, if I didn't know it, if I did know it before, if anything, I've just cemented that what I believed in was right. Mm-hmm. You know, so even if it's something that I, that, that I completely disagree with, I, I think I've reinforced that knowledge of I'm not going to do that because that hurt somebody or, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so yeah, that's one of the things we do need to learn is being able to accept of opinions, opinions. So it was very opinionated. Um, but you seem to deal with it well because it's like I think people trusted you to to be to to let everyone talk and not get so involved in commenting on people's opinions. Some, but just kind of giving people the space to say stuff that's important to them, and that's kind of that's not an easy role to do. I don't. Think. No, I think it needed more. And we we done two, um, but I think he could have done with maybe another one. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. at least. But um, but who knows? Maybe it will come around again in the same format or in a different format. And maybe we could go into it a big, a bit deeper. But yeah, it was really good. It, it was really good, and it's just really important that people understand that it's someone's opinion, and it doesn't mean you have to agree with it just because this person has a stage or has a camera on them, or is in a Zoom room and it's going live online or whatever like that, doesn't mean that they're perfect and it doesn't mean that what they're saying is exactly right. But what they're saying um, could well plant a seed in somebody else's head that could take that forward and bring around something positive, you know? Yeah, it's thought-provoking stuff, definitely. And what what kind of stuff can we expect to look forward from you sort of going forward? Have you got anything in, in the pipeline? Um, I'm, I'm investigating... Uh, uh, different stuff in it because who knows what it's going to be like I, I'm a bit unsure how things are going to be you know what I mean oh, and it's oh, it's really hard to plan when you can't see how the thing's going to be you know so um, yeah it, it's it's quite hard to say that obviously I'm I'm always going to do music one way or another even if I, I even if I end up DJing in a pub you know you walk past a pub one night and you'll see me in there DJing you know <laughs> um it, <laughs> I'll buy a drink solo. So I'm always going to do something to do with music, definitely. I mean, I'm still recording. Um, I, I've recorded some new songs lately um, in the last couple of weeks or so. Uh, I've got a new a new track and a video looking to looking to be released very soon once they finish in with the video. And um, as far as, yeah, I, I would really like to investigate some other sides, more of the hosting side, the debate kind of thing, like that kind of presenting television online show presenting i'd like to investigate that more i'd love to do more of that i really would love to do more of that yeah you do a great job of it definitely so i do you know you, you thank you thank you very much so yeah i'd love to i'd love to do more of that i definitely would love to do more of that but yeah the, um it's an open book you know never say never well listen <laughs> we've, we've been talking a while so what I'll, I'll kind of bring it to sort of the end of the interview by asking the question that i ask everyone who's uh, been on the podcast which is um my book of dub, I write everyone's name in it. What what would you want written next to your name? Something, you know, that you want associated with, with Solo Banson? Or have you got anything you want to say about that? Um, what would I like written next to my name? Um, ooh, bring, bringer of joy. You know, His Majesty said, you know, uh, one can derive more, more pleasure from giving than receiving, you know. And, and I, I definitely do. So if I'm... Um, if someone says says to me, "Oh, you made me happy," or "You made me laugh," or even if you just made me smile, then um, that kind of fulfills me. 
So um, I, I, I'd be happy to have that written next to my name, entertainer, or you know, bring bring her of joy yeah, in that way. There, you know, yeah, I, I'd be happy. I'd be very happy with that. Yeah, nice. And it's like in these times when you know we're used to bringing the joy personally to people on stage or whatever. It's like that can't be done. It's kind of you know, it's just a bit of a challenge, really, isn't it? Because like what you were saying earlier on about releasing, and you know, for people listening who who don't release tunes and stuff we don't realize it's so hard to know how to release stuff if we can't go out there and promote it and get it to people and it's kind of it's just yeah it's, times, it's, it's been it? a difficult period you know I've, I've had my struggles along the way you know uh, um i think many of us have uh, i don't know if many of us have spoken about it but i think i think many of us have and but especially us in, in the music industry it's just like it's been a struggle so even when I was recording these new songs that I've been recording, there was a point when I was like, I found it hard. I found it hard to find the motivation to write because I couldn't see an end point. I was like, well, what am I doing this for? If I'm not going to be out there to promote it, or I'm not going to be out there to perform it, kind of thing. And and um and like you say, just the release, just not doing what comes to us naturally, just not doing what what my body calls for, which is to be doing some form of music. And bringing joy to people, just not doing that, uh, makes you feel inhuman. Uh, you know, um, it makes you makes me feel like I'm just uh, yeah, just existing. You know, and not actually living. You know, and you know, without wanting to go on like some crazy COVID depressing one, because it's not something I've spoken about much on the podcast. But it is, you know, the longer it goes on, and the more that you know, playing music to people and just looks further and further away. It's like because I think for for a while everyone was like, okay little temporary glitch, little temporary glitch, but it's looking more long-term now. So that just throws up a, a lot of yeah, challenges. Yeah, a lot. A lot. So again, and may, and maybe that's another reason um, why I really do want to investigate these other stuff, you know, because um, anything that's going to bring some form of entertainment and knowledge to people needs to be done. So, you know, maybe that's a, a good reason why to look into these avenues as well. To do something because people, people need something, you know. I need something as well, you know what I mean? So, no, for real, for real. Well, Solo, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, real pleasure. Thank you. Give thanks for the invite. And hopefully, I'll see you in an airport. So, can we only ever see each other at airports or, or crossing? There's a lot of airports in the world, so we've got, we've got many, oh. many more to tick off our list. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me and Solo for the 22nd episode of the Life in Dub podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to Life in Dub to tell your friends and family about Life in Dub and just help get the word out. You can visit the website lifeindub.com to listen back to any of the 22 episodes. And if you want to get in touch, just email me, vibronics at gmail.com and I'll see you all again in two weeks for the next Life in Dub podcast. <laughs>